comes up. Yeah. I took a clap through it, but you know, people are like, I don't know if I should clap. They have a hard time with that. And, and Matt never claps on me. Yes, that's funny. Um, yeah, I love that song. This is my confidence, you've never failed me yet. And it's like one of those things, like the first time I heard that song, I was like, you've never failed me yet. Is that like saying, oh, but you're going to fail me one of these days? No, the confidence is, is that you've never failed me yet. And, and he can put the yet there because he knows God's never going to fail him. God is never going to fail him. And uh, it, it just reminded me of this last week. Um, um, you wouldn't think, but I run on a treadmill every once in a while. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think I would do that, but I'm running on the treadmill, and it kind of just hit me. I was like, man. God has never let me down. And I was like, it, I don't know. It's like, I've thought that before. God, you know, is never going to fail me, but he's, he's, you know, he's never going to let me down. But it, and he's never going to give up on us and stuff. But it kind of just hit me. I was like, he has never failed me, or he has never, he's never let me down. And, and I can't say that for myself or anyone else on this earth. But it was just one of those things that just hit me harder than I thought because, I don't know, it was just an amazing thing because I'm, I'm not that easy to please. <laughs> you know, I got a lot of bad attitudes and, and, and feelings and emotions and hurts like people, uh, everyone else. And it's like, but God has been able to just bring me through a lot of that stuff. And when I think it's him, it's not, ever, it's not him. It's not him. Um, so this morning, we could, uh, we've got a sermon called what do you think? What do you think? And this is uh, something I believe God gave to me. Is actually, I got like one point, but now I got to spend like 30 minutes, you know, filling 28 minutes worth of time to make this one point that I think, I think that the church, um, we can use, and we, we can use this one. And so I'll start it with this. Who do you think you are? Like, honestly, who do you think you are? I could ask my son Levi, who are you? And he'll say, I'm Levi James. Right? Who do you think you are? Do you, do you ever sit and think about that? Do you ever ponder that? Who am I? Who am I? Who are you? Like I was talking about the kids, are you a good person? Would you consider yourself a good person? I think most of us would probably say, yeah, I think I'm a good person. Right? But... I usually tell people, it's like, oh, yeah, you think you're a good person? I'm like, yeah, I think I'm a good person until I get put in the right circumstances, and I guarantee I'm, I might be afraid of what comes out. Or are you a bad person? You just make bad decisions. You're a good person that makes bad decisions. But who do you think you are? Like, if I came to you and I said, raise your hand if you're a liar. Let's, let's try that. Raise your hand if you're a liar. I get a couple honest people raising their hands because it's one of those things, like no one wants to raise their hand to, I'm a liar because they're like, well, I don't consider myself a liar because I don't lie all the time, right? I don't lie all the time, so am I really a liar? Well, yes. But I don't like to call myself a liar. I heard this story about, this is Craig Groeschel, he was talking about, was like, he was talking about integrity, and he says, I think of myself as a, a person with a lot of integrity, he's like, but, you know, my wife and I were looking for this uh, specific, like, jumper thing for our kids, and I happened to see one at a garage sale, right, I went in there, and I talked to the lady, and she's like, it is $50, he's like, well, it's $100, no. he's like, I'll give you $25, and they're, like, haggling back and forth, and then... And they started haggling some more, and he's like, you know, I'm a pastor at this church down the street. She's like, oh, you are? So, yeah, I'll give it to you for $20, you know. They go back, and he's like, he's like, yeah, I'm a pastor down the street. He's like, but he's like, and I only have a 20, right? And then what happened, he's like, they came with that deal, and he opened his wallet, and he had a $100 bill. He's like, I think I have a lot of integrity until I'm in a haggling situation where I say I only have 20 bucks, but yeah, yeah. It's like, now you've now you got to make change. <laughs> um, who do you think you are, really? Who are you? What type of person are you? I will ask, are you a Christian? Or are you a skeptic? 
I would say, are you looking to be different or are you satisfied with who you think you are? Thinking is tough. It's a tough thing to do. It takes, it takes intellectual devotion, <laughs> you know? And, and if you have kids at home, thinking can be real tough. I can't even have a conversation most of the time. <laughs> It was like, I was trying to talk, talk, I was like, I got something to say. It's like, yeah, I forgot, whatever, we'll just move on. But what I find in the scriptures is that what we think and how we think matters. It really does. What we think and how we think really matters. And so today I would like to take some time that we could just get together as a church or a skeptics, a bunch of liars, a bunch of hypocrites, People without integrity, right? Let's get together with some honest people today and take a look at what we think. And let's take an honest look at it and let's challenge our beliefs. So before we start, let's, let's, let's pray. <clears throat> God, you are welcome here. And we know that you're here, Lord. I pray during this time of uh, teaching that you just make your presence evident. I pray that you give me the words to say. I pray that we have ears to hear, Lord, to all of us. Lord, I pray that we can come away from today just greatly encouraged and thoughtful, Lord. Um, teach us to think about ourselves the way that you think about us. And bless this time together. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have a confession. I hate. I mean, hate is a strong word. I'm trying to get my kids not to say hate. I, I went up to my son Timmy the other day and I went like this, like Adam. He's like, he punched my butt and he said, I hate your butt. I'm like, where did he get that? I deserved it, but, you know, hate is a strong word. Okay, I, I always get off here. Okay, I have a strong dislike for self-edification. I have a strong dislike for people that I look at or are, like, trying to pump themselves up all the time, you know, like, the, the power of positive thinking people. And not that I don't think, you know, having good attitudes and good thoughts is a good thing, but it kind of gets under my skin sometimes. You know, you see the people on TV or the movies that are just trying to suck, psych themselves out in the mirror. I'm just like, come on, man. You can do it. You, you want to brown out, kick the face with these bad boys? Oh, that's a quote of movies. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, man, you are the best around. No one's ever going to keep you down. You're going to dominate with your dominant domination. Just, you know, <laughs> you can do it. You're so awesome. I try, you know, maybe that's a little far out there, <laughs> but that's what I picture about like self edification like sitting in the beer, positive reinforcements. I don't like it because it usually doesn't have anything to do with God's word. Um, and I look at it, it's like, it, sure, it might get you amped up to like sweep someone's leg. But anyway, it's the karate, the karate kid reference. But as Christ followers, does that kind of stuff help in any way? You know, maybe if you need to run, you know, you're running a triathlon or something for charity. I don't know. Let me say it this way. Does it really help us at all if the truths that we tell ourselves in the mirror are not even truths at all? I don't think it helps us. I think it hurts us. Actually, I know it does. But I was looking at that. I'm like, okay. What about false humility? I look at that too and I'm like, man, I, I know I've suffered from this. Um, it's almost like someone's using their goodness or like their gentleness as a badge of honor to kind of get people to praise them. I've seen people do it like, oh, I'm really humble and I'm really gentle, but what you're doing is you're just putting on a show so people will like praise you. But when they do praise you, you're like, oh, you did a really good job, I appreciate it. They're like, oh, it wasn't me, it was just God. Right, but the, act, the real response is thank you, thank you, thank you. I went and I was 
since we're talking about humility, I went and I looked up the definition, and it says, a modest or low view of one's importance. A modest or low view of a person's importance. And, and from a biblical standpoint, I completely disagree with that. That is not the biblical definition of humility at all. So if you're going to write down a note, this is not up here today. The biblical definition of humility is this, right thinking. It's just simple, right thinking. Romans 12, 3, this should come up today. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each one of you. So humility is not what you think about you. It's what God thinks about you. Think about yourself the way God has said he thinks about you. So right thinking is like you look at God's word, you look at the truth, and you take that and you say, well, okay, I think about me this way, but what does God think about me? How does God think about me? And it's not that easy. <laughs> it's a tough, it's a, it's a, it's a battlefield. Um, which I was learning my Bible study this morning. That's pretty fun. Today, um, I found a couple parables. One you probably wouldn't consider a parable. I'm still calling it a parable. Um, that Jesus told us. Uh, and, and really, my hope is that we walk away with a better understanding in like a foundation to stand on when it comes to God and who or what he wants to think we are. I think I'm saying that weird. I just want to walk away today with all of us looking at the scriptures or looking at God with a better understanding of what he thinks he wants us to think about. No, what we need to think about, I can't even, I can't even say it. <laughs> um, so if you have Bibles, uh, Luke 18, 9 through 14 today. Most people don't bring their Bibles anymore. This is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. It says, to some, who were in, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who exalt themselves, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I have to say, this is probably one of my favorite parables, you know, in the Bible. And it's essentially we have Jesus responding to people who thought they were awesome. <laughs> really, just to simplify it, and had it all together and looked down on everyone else. I'm pretty sure we've all been that person, right? But Jesus in here gives us a picture of two different men, and one of them is a Pharisee, an ultra-religious person that, and a self-righteous person, a person that just, like, I know the Bible, I know the scriptures, God loves me, and, uh, you know, I'm better off than everyone else because I'm not a sinner anymore. Just self-righteous, like, it, it's... I literally have the first book, five books of the scriptures memorized, so no one needs to tell me anything about anything. I know, um, I'm religious. Some guy asked me the other day, are you religious? I just said, no. Because <laughs> that word has been hijacked. <laughs> it, where it doesn't just mean relationship, it means everything else but relationship these days. I'm taking it back. Religion means relationship. So if you say religious, make sure you have a relationship. Don't make sure you're just self-righteous. And, yeah. But then we have the tax collector, a lower-than-low sinner. Like, what's low? Like, these, this is, you know, 
over 2,000 years ago, is like, what's worse than a sinner, I mean a tax collector now? Is there actually anything worse than the IRS? <laughs> yeah. I was like, what? I don't know. I'm not sure if there's anything else worse. And what we have here, um, we have a picture of someone who thinks that they are better than others. Someone that thinks they're better than others. And partially because they thought they didn't sin as bad as others, so they judge themselves against other people that are worse than them. But also because they thought they earned their righteousness by merely following some religious observances. And we all fall into this trap. We can all be a Pharisee and, and, uh, and worship tradition and, and just doing things the way that we've always done things, and that's why I'm good with God. Well, I always tell people at Bible study, it's like, but, you know, if you're walking around, let's say this is God's face, and you're looking, you know, God's trying to look at you, and you're always turning away from it. That's the picture of where we mo- most of us are at a lot of the times in our lives. We don't really... We don't want. We really don't want to catch God's glances because we know He's gonna He's gonna slay us. We'd rather settle on our pious piousness, I guess, just what we think we are, but not who He thinks we are or who He thinks we should be. Well, I just look at that parable, and I also have the contrast that, of someone that knew that they were a sinner. So much so that they would not even look at, up to heaven and simply ask for mercy. I've been that person. And I think most of us have been that person. If you call yourself a Christian, you have to be that person at some time. And Jesus said that that sinner went home that day justified before God. And I was like, what, you know, why? Why did that guy go home justified before God? It's not like he did anything special, really. He just wasn't arrogant, you know? And, and, and I'm looking at the end of that where it says, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And I think what Jesus is saying is if you think of yourself higher than you should, you're eventually going to hit some kind of truth that's going to be really hard to swallow, right? Eventually, if you walk around thinking you or the boss Haas, right? You're going to hit a point with God that he's going to have to knock you down a couple rungs. And not because he's like a hateful God. It's just going to happen. You're going to run into it and you're like, uh, man. It's like taking the best seat and then someone else more important comes into the room. They're like, uh, sir, you're going to have to sit over here because you're not the awesomest person ever. I know you tell yourself that in the mirror, but whatever. I'm going to get myself in trouble. I know it. I know myself. I'm going to get myself in trouble. And typically, uh, I feel like that manifests itself in a person that's finding an excuse why it doesn't apply to them, but then they require it from everyone else. Like, I don't have to do that, but everyone else has to follow that. That's how I usually see it happening. Uh, James 4 and Proverbs 3 says, but he gives us more grace. That's why the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And then Proverbs 3, 34 says this. It says, he mocks the proud mockers and shows favor to the humble and the oppressed. And I was looking at um, this word opposes. It's like, okay, what is that? What does, that, what does that mean? What does it mean that God opposes somebody? And it's like a, kind of like a sports. There's a, it's talking about sports. It's like God's playing on the opposite team that you're on. Um, well, that seems bad. <laughs> that, seems, that seems like there's no way to win if God's on a different team than you are. He's on a different team. He's playing against you. I, I had this, uh, I was thinking about this, and I had, I had this kind of vision in my mind of, uh, I was watching a YouTube video of this guy that's trying to teach a calf, like how to be bridled or have I, the thing on their face and like, so you can walk them, right? And it's like, he's trying to pull this, um, he's trying to pull this calf, and the calf is like fighting him and fighting him, and uh, 
and, uh, but he's like really patient with the calf, you know, and just like, okay, let's go. You're fighting him, but you're still going with him slowly, slowly. And I kind of get a picture of like how gentle God is with us when like we have the right attitude, you know. Just imagine God opposing you. He's like, there's grass over there, but he's going to block the calf instead of getting, o- getting over there. Just like, I'm going to be in your way, and you're never going to get there because I'm opposing you in this. Try, the, try to get past God, right? But the other one, it's like a patient. It's like patience trying to train an animal to do something, to follow you somewhere. It's like, they're like flipping out, you know? And then, but it's kind of... Reset, let's start over, reset, start over. And I just kind of get that picture. I want God on my team. I want him to be patient with me. I want him to take me to the green pastures that I'm supposed to be in and not be, you know, I might fight him a little bit, but it, but not like, I don't want to be so proud that I'm doing, I can do it on my own that he's on the other team. If we look at these two people, the the two phrases in that parable, it says, the Pharisee stood by himself. Isn't that kind of a picture of self-righteousness? He stood by himself, right? I could do this on my own. And the sinner said that he stood at a distance. It's like he felt like he couldn't even approach God. And so I look at that like one of them, the self-righteousness, the other one, um, it felt like they couldn't even approach God. And, and, I think, and I think looking at the sinner, like that is probably not necessarily true, right? But I kind of look at it from a Christian perspective, not back in these days. And I'm like, okay, what if these two were Christians? You know, how would this parable play out? And this, uh, bear with me, I wrote this down and it's gonna fall apart really quick. All my analogies do. <laughs> it just happens. Two men headed off to church, Harvest Christian Fellowship. One of them has been walking with the Lord for a while now and has a lot of faith and confidence, right? The other man was right off the streets, but a new believer, or at least trying to believe. The mature Christian looked up to heaven and thanked God for how far God has taken him. He thanked God that he was able to give a tenth of all his income. And thank God that he was allowed to learn about the benefit of fasting and praying. While doing so, he noticed the other, the other man alone, off by himself, weeping and beating his chest, chest without much confidence in God, or without much confidence that God even loved him. So he went over and kneeled with the man and wept with him and proclaimed the truth of Jesus with him and encouraged him with the same love that had been given to him. And then they left church and they went to Wendy's. I look at that story and it's like, you know, the first one we got the Pharisees standing there on pious, but then we, I'm like, from a Christian standpoint, what if you have been walking with the Lord a long time, but it's a different, it's a different thing from me, from me to God. And it's one of my fill-ins today. I mean, my only fill-in. With right thinking, there will be a transference from what we did to what God did. And that is a big deal. That is a big deal. And that's why I'm so thankful for the cross. So I don't have to, like, just be a religious nut. I can have a relationship with God, and I can say, this is what God did, and this is how he changed me. You know, I don't have to look down on sinners and say, oh, they're a sinner. They do this, that, and the other thing. I'm like, that was me not that long ago. That was actually me about five seconds ago in my head. That was me. That was me. And it's just a it's just a different way of thinking. Let's look at another parable, which is not a parable, but I call it a parable. It's kind of like a parable. This is a lot of this is a lot of reading here, so bear with me. There's no way I could get away from not uh, saying all of it. Said. So, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to a Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, 
kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. Jesus said, you have, the, you have judged correctly. Well, yeah. Then he turned toward the woman and said, Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet, which kind of freaks me out just to think about, honestly. <laughs> I want to put on an extra pair of socks. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love is shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith is saved, you go in peace. I know that's a lot of reading, but I'm looking at the last thing I read, and I, I look at this, and, and I'm like, well, the first part that comes out to me is like, Simon's like, if th was thinking to himself, um, if this man were a prophet, just imagine you're sitting in a room, you're like, hmm, if this guy was a prophet, he would know who he's talking, and then all of a sudden it's like, Jesus answered him. Uh, uh, maybe he's a little bit more than a prophet. <laughs> if he's reading, he knows exactly what you're thinking, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, Simon, you might want to reconsider this, uh, if this man were a prophet indict indictment. Okay, so who will love God more? The one with the, one with the biggest debt forgiven, right? Who will love God more, the one with the biggest debt forgiven? It just makes logical sense when you read it, right? And, and I look at that, and I've read, I've read that before, and, but what I really think is I think Jesus is trying to teach us something much bigger than that, you know, much bigger than that. And, and I, I kind of just look at my life. I'm like, God saved me, I believe, from what most people would say is a rough life. You know, I was definitely a sinner. I have a testimony to prove it, and I, had a, uh, I would say I have a very sinful past, so I should love God more than people that didn't, right? I, I don't know. I don't think that's true. I'm going to get ahead of myself here. I have sinned a lot, so no, I have been forgiven a lot, so I should love a lot, right? But what about you? This is like me and my wife. You know, we have these, we, these conversations like, what if you haven't been forgiven as much as someone else? Does that mean you can't love God as much as the greater sinner? And we have these conversations like, you know, because I grew up a little bit more rough than she had, and she's like, you know, she wasn't perfect by, by no means. Um, I don't know if her mom knows that. She's here today. But, 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 you know, you can get in your head that, oh, well, I was raised in church. I didn't you know, I didn't go out and I didn't do a bunch of drugs. I wasn't an alcoholic. I didn't, you know, I wasn't in an abusive relationship. I wasn't this, this, and that. So you look at that, it's like, well, I guess I can't love God as much as a person that messed up a bunch of their life. That, that can't be what Jesus is saying. That can't be what he's saying. And so it's, some, it's about something else. This is all about, this is about something else. And I don't know if you caught this earlier, but when the last scripture we read, Simon the Pharisee said to himself. You know, another word of saying, said to himself, was he thought. And Jesus answered this guy's thoughts. And so this scripture is not about who sinned more or who sinned less. It's about who thinks they have been forgiven will love God more. Whoever thinks, this is about thought life. 
how much, is, how much do you think God has forgiven you? It's, been, it's all. Do you ever consider that? God has forgiven you all? So it doesn't matter if you're the bigger sinner or the person that God spared many sorrows. Fortunately, somehow, you know, maybe you had good parents that were raising you the right way and were leading you on the right path, you know, but you've still been forgiven all. We don't have to weigh, oh, this is, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I was a greater sinner, now I love more. No, I, I've been get forgiven all. And, and it's one of those traps that's like, I think people can fall in, like, I love people more because I was a greater sinner, or I can't love as much because, but we've been forgiven all. It doesn't make any sense. Isaiah 46, or 40, 64, 6, says, all of us have become like one who is unclean. So all means all. Right? I'm trying to explain that to my kids. And all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. This is all the things that we think that are good that we're doing compared to God. It's not good. We all have shriveled up like a leaf. We think we're awesome, but we're just dry leaves floating around in the wind. Like the wind, our sins sweep us away. I look at that and I was like, just imagine if the, the Pharisee in the first parable stopped looking down on the sinner and the sinner stopped looking down and they both looked at the cross for their righteousness. And I think this day and age is the church of Jesus Christ gathered. That we get, this is an amazing opportunity we have. We have it plainly before us, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he came to die for sinners who I am the worst and you are the worst who forgave us all, died for our sins, raised again on the third day, and ascended into heaven. We have a, a God that's, this is, ama- this is amazing. And that song, Lift Your Head Weary Sinner, I'm like, this applies to all of us. We can't just stand on, on our own righteousness and be like, I'm not like these people. Or we can't sit over by ourselves, fearful of God and saying, you know, beat my chest, I can't lift my eyes to God, because God, if you're a Christian, he's already forgiven you. I understand how that feels. I understand it's hard to think that you're forgiven all, but you are forgiven all. And I, that doesn't mean you get a license to sin or any of those things, but um, we have just amazing grace. What we need to do is we need to stop thinking about what you did, whether perceived good or bad, and focus on what he did. And what we think really matters. It matters in this church. It matters in our walk with Christ. We, we need to think differently that we have been forgiven all. And I think, that was punny. No. Sometimes I feel like we're, we're missing some passion in the church. Well, some churches have a lot of passion. <laughs> so much so that everyone gets a tambourine, right? Everyone gets a tambourine. You get one. They, they leave them out for everyone to go for it. <laughs> but if you think you're self-righteous, you're not going to be that passionate. And you're not going to have much zeal because you did it yourself. And if you think that God doesn't love you and hasn't forgiven all your sins, you're not going to be that passionate. And you're not going to be that zealous because... You haven't been changed. But if you look at the cross and think, I have been forgiven all, and this could be for everyone, wouldn't you be more passionate, more zealous? Yeah, it drives me crazy sometimes. Band, you guys could come up. I said 30 minutes, and I meant it. I wouldn't be a good preacher at all if I didn't put Philippians 4.8 up here. Because it's about thinking. <laughs> it says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, capital T, 
whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And so there's the power of positive thinking for you. Right? It comes right out of the Bible. Right? And it's because you've been forgiven all. Now, get up. And let people know that you've been forgiven all. And you didn't do it. It wasn't you. It wasn't you. It was him. And if we think that way, the world will never be the same. Right. Who do you think you are? Are you a dearly loved child of God? You think God hates you? Doesn't love you? Jesus died, so we could have confidence in the fact that um, we are his sons and daughters, and, and we're loved, and we're forgiven, and, and I pray, um, or just say, like, if anyone doesn't feel loved or forgiven by God, um, let someone know. Or write down on the app, on the app, if you need prayer on, on your card to put in there, we're here to pray for you guys, and, um, and it's, it's nice to have a community of people that could pray for you. It's a, it's a big deal. And, and um, I encourage you guys to do that more. Because some days I feel like I just can stand on my own and it's an error. And other days I can't lift my head to God and I'm just like, I'm a sinner. But he forgave my wrong thinking. And, and I pray as a church, he really teaches us uh, humility and just knowing his word and, and what that means. It's, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing just to be able to extend that good news to somebody and say, God loves you. Come to the, welcome to our family. I'm not just saying this church, I'm just saying in general. He puts the lonely in families, and uh, we're the lonely ones. And this is our family, and I'm thankful for it today. Would you guys pray for us? I mean, pray with them. <laughs> Lord, bless this day. Um, I'll pray for uh, Pastor Jim. Hopefully he's having a fun time in Florida. I pray they're having sunny days over there. Um, bring him back refreshed and renewed and uh, just bless that time um, with, uh, that he's having with the, the little girls. Lord, bless this congregation and just remind us of who you are and uh, what we are in you. Lord, remind us to think right. Don't let uh, the devil just get into our minds and think wrong. Lord, remind us of the scriptures that say, tell us who we are in you. Lord, I pray we stand on you and your, just as a foundation, Lord. As a church, we go through rough times, we go through good times, Lord. I just pray that, um, that as a community, we just lift you up in all of and I pray over this uh, Easter service that we're coming, Lord. I pray that you bring the hands, the help, um, and the hearts. Just fill our hearts with this, the desire to um, be like you for this community, in this community, in this world. And desperately is searching for you and cannot see you. Lord, I pray that uh, they will see you through us. And uh, I pray that all in Jesus' name.